Good morning and welcome to Home Church Online here at New Life Christian Centre, Christie's Beach in South Australia. It's great to have you with us today and we trust that God is going to bless your heart as uh, we gather, as you watch, as you participate in worship today. So why don't we open in prayer? Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your presence. Lord, I pray for every person watching and participating right now that you would bless them where they're at. Father, you'd meet their needs. You'd help them in their lives. And Father, today you would speak deeply into each of our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to see you and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, If you want to find out what's happening in the life of our church, please go to our website, www.newlifeonline.org.au. Perhaps you've accessed the online service through that portal. Uh, Obviously, we have Facebook and uh, uh, other social media as well. But we've got great things happening in the life of our church. We've got youth group on Friday nights. We've got children's and youth church Sunday morning through our morning service at 10 a.m. That's for kids, something age appropriate for them. While the adults adults worship in the main auditorium, there's uh, men's functions, ladies' gatherings. There's all sorts of things in the life of the church. Please check us out online and see what's coming up. If you're in our area, we'd love you to join us. Uh, particularly for Sunday, 10 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. But if you're coming to our services, you want to come, please register by emailing info at newlifeonline.org.au. Let us know you're coming. Obviously, there's certain restrictions at the moment. We're going to uh, celebrate our giving today. And, you know, when I give my offerings, my tithes and my free will offerings, I do it as an act of worship. It's an act that demonstrates and acknowledges that Jesus is my Lord and my Saviour, that I'm not dependent on the world to provide for me. I'm dependent upon God. Obviously, he uses various means and sources to bring provision our way, but he is our source. And giving is the step of faith that acknowledges that as we give our tithes and our offerings. And I'm going to pray for you today, whatever your need is, that God would touch your life and help you at this time. Father, we thank you for the joy of giving. We know that you're the great giver. You gave your all, you gave your one and only son to die for us, that we might have eternal life. Lord God, we thank you that through his sacrifice, we're restored in right relationship with you. And Father, as we give today, we thank you that we can give joyfully, willingly, and as an act of worship. And Father, I pray your blessing upon every person that's giving, that you'd prosper the work of their hands. Father, if they have needs today, whether it be employment or finance or whatever it is, Father, we pray that you would come through for them. Lord, we know that uh, we can look to this world or we can look to you. And Father, we choose to look to you today as our provider in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got uh, Rebecca bringing our children's and youth talk. And uh, also we're going to have our communion time as well. So please uh, grab your uh, communion gear if you're joining with us in uh, these uh, in, in communion, so grab your bread and your water or juice or whatever you're using there, but sit back and, and participate in this. Good morning. Let's come around the table of communion together. Let's read 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. When I read those words, do this in remembrance of me, I love to do exactly that. Remember all the things Jesus has done for me. One such thing is justification. We have been made right in God's sight. Romans 1, 1 to 2 says, So now, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, We can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. For because of our faith, he has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward 
to actually becoming all that God has had in mind for us to be. When we were unsaved, we were at enmity with God. Enmity is active opposition or hostility. We could not obey God's law or fulfill his will. He declared us sinners, which in the true meaning of the phrase was a declaration of war. We were actively opposed to his will. But then a wonderful thing happened. We were justified. This means God declared us righteous. In other words, we were right, made right in God's sight. This was a de declaration of peace. We have been made right in God's sight. How could such a wonderful thing happen? It was only made possible by Christ's death on the cross. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, we now have peace with God. In dying for us, Jesus took care of our past, our present and our future. Peace with him takes care of the past. He will no longer hold our sins against us. He has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand. This takes care of the present. We can come to him at any time for the help we need. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has had in mind for us to be. This takes care of the future. One day we shall be like him, just as he planned from the beginning. Justification is a lasting thing. When God declared we have been made right in his sight, he gave to us an assurance that we cannot be lost. So in remembrance of this wonderful truth, let's eat and drink. But above all, in remembrance of the one who made it possible. Let's eat. And let's drink together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have made this possible for us, made it possible for us to be right in God's sight. You have justified us. There's no fear. There's no condemnation. We are safe. We are secure. Help us always to remember this, but especially as we eat your body and drink your blood. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm speaking on the fact that love matters most. In particular, I'll be focusing on genuine love, what it is, why we need it, and how we can display it in our lives. Now, love is an extremely overused word. People can say, I love this cupcake, I love getting good grades, or I love my family and friends. There are massive differences in love towards different things. You can't love your child in the same way you love your mother. It is just different. The Greeks have three main words for love, the first being agape, which is unconditional love, a sacrificial love that is love in action, which is what God instructs us to have towards others. It is to love others not based upon emotion or affiliations. The second is philia. This is the love between friends, a brotherly love. This love is more motivated by self-interest, but not entirely. And the third is eros, which is a romantic love. I believe from my heart that genuine love is the love of God, the unconditional love where we make the choice to love others and not follow the dictation of our feelings. This genuine love is what Jesus calls us to have with others. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Jesus didn't love others based upon his feelings. We see that he made a choice to love the sinners, those who mocked him and who beat him. He did this all through the cross. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus loved the world through his sacrifice on the cross. 
He loved those who did him wrong. He demonstrated what sacrificial love is. He calls us to do the same, to take up our cross each day, to sacrifice our fleshly desires and serve him and love others. He rewards us for this, a much greater reward than we could ever gain ourselves. Why do we need to love, though? This is a fallen world. There is so much sin that has corrupted it, so many selfish people. The world has become blind of what is right and wrong. In the eyes of the world, what was once wrong is slowly slipping into acceptable. The world needs love to change that. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 12. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. As Christians, we have the unique opportunity to make a difference in the way we love. With this genuine love, we choose to not be selfish. Each time we love others, we make God so happy. Who doesn't want to make God happy? The world will look at the way we love and think, why? Where does this unconditional love come from? And to that, we answer Jesus. How can we love, though? To love others with a genuine love, I believe we need to be alert. Alert to our surroundings and what is happening right in front of our eyes. Each day gives us an opportunity to display genuine love. We need to be more alert to take those opportunities and not to let them slip by. But we have all done this before. It's because it's the easier option to just let something slip by. But whenever was the easier option the best one? So I encourage you today, love others with the same love of God. Don't wait for your feelings to tell you to love that person. Don't wait for your feelings to persuade you to be kind to a certain person. Make a choice. Choose to love others. Be proactive and be alert. Let's pray. Dear beautiful, beautiful Father, thank you for your love towards us. You sacrificed your one and only Son to save us because you so loved the world. Help us, dear Father, to love others the same way you love us. Help your children make a difference in the world through love. Don't let us be timid in finding ways to love, but confident in every situation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's come around the Word of God together and let's pray. Father, we pray that as we look at the Scripture, as we look at this theme today, that you would bless our hearts and open up our hearts to understand more deeply your purpose and your plan for our lives and what it really means to be in Christ and in your church. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've got a great series happening at the moment in all three of our congregations, Adelaide Christian Centre in the city, here at New Life Christian Centre, and in Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory. The series is 40 Days of Supporting Relationships. Now, whole focus is on enhancing our relationships, but also particularly our relationships in the church, because as God's people, we're called to be his church in the world. Church means called out ones. It's the Greek word ecclesia, which means the called out ones. And there's that sense of being called together for a divine purpose and as the family of God. So we're focusing on that. And today, uh, the title to my message is Authentic Community, Living the Koinonia Lifestyle. Living the Koinonia Lifestyle. Well, what is that word koinonia, you might be asking? Koinonia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. It's a Greek word. It's the Greek word for fellowship. So let's read a verse of scripture. A couple of verses. Acts chapter 2. Verse 41 to 43, it says, Those who accepted his message, that is the gospel, were baptized. Now, Peter, the apostle, had stood up on that day of Pentecost, preached the gospel, and many, many people came to Christ, put their trust in him, and were baptized. It says about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. They were heady days in the birth of the church, that period when many thousands were coming to Christ, the church was being formed, and really exciting times. Uh, the, the fruit of what Jesus had died for on the cross was starting to come to fruition and that was the saving of so many people 
And to this day, the church has been growing. But what we see here is the early church modeling for us what it is to be the church. And so when they came to the Lord, they were baptized and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were gathering around the teaching of the word of God because that is the rule of life. And to fellowship. Now, that word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, which we'll look at in a moment. They gathered, well, they were devoted to the breaking of bread, that's communion, and to prayer. And you see those elements in Christian worship and church life uh, right around the world today, and as it has been for 2,000 years. So we see there that they devoted themselves to the fellowship. That's the Greek word koinonia. It actually means partnership. It has many aspects to its meaning. And throughout the New Testament, you see different English words used to describe the particular aspect of what koinonia means. For example, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he talks about their generosity and their giving and the help that they were providing suffering Christians or other believers who were suffering. And he uses the word koinonia to describe that generous help. In his letter to the Philippian church, He talks about the sharing that they have in the sufferings of Christ. And that word sharing is also the Greek word koinonia. So to convey the application of that word in different contexts, different English words are used throughout the New Testament, and there are others as well. But essentially, um, if we draw all of those meanings together into one, it means partnership, contribution, participation, sharing in or sharing with, Communion, so there's a common union, spiritual fellowship and a fellowship in the spirit. And you see those meanings reflected in this word koinonia throughout the New Testament. Taken as a dynamic whole, koinonia conveys the full scope of our intimate union together in Christ. It involves active participation in Christian community. Okay, so when you're saved, you're saved into the community of God, of Christ. And Koinonia uh, describes active participation in fellowship. So it goes beyond just kind of having your name on the book, so to speak, to coming into active participation. It's sharing in the spiritual blessings that we have together in Christ and also the giving of material blessings. So we can't say we're in fellowship if we're ignoring the needs of one another. There needs to be an expression of koinonia in helping and sharing not only our spiritual blessings, but our material blessings with each other. And you see that in the birth of the church. When they came together in koinonia, they shared what they had with each other. And they were making sure that there was none that was lacking, whether it be spiritually or relationally and materially. So we see the demonstration of koinonia in very practical ways. It's this commonality that we have in Christ that is um, expressed in koinonia. You know, you can travel anywhere in the world today and find Christians in every culture uh, right across the world. And that means that in every culture and every place we have brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a bond together that is completely unique compared to any other human bond or organization. So, for example, in in Paul's letter to the Romans we see that the Gentile believers in Macedonia had nothing in common with the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. They were kind of worlds apart culturally and uh, geographically, but it was their union in Christ that held them in that common bond together. And it's exciting to know that when Jesus died on the cross, yes, he died for the individual. If you were the only person left on the planet, Christ would have died for you. But he died to bring us into his family, into his church, into his community uh, of forever people, so to speak. And it's wonderful to be a part of that. It's an indissoluble union and bond. In fact, so much so that God calls us brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise God. So I want to talk about the koinonia lifestyle because fellowship is more than just hanging out with friends in the church. As we've been saying, it has a deeper Um, and multi-layered meaning and depth to it. So I want to explore that today. But firstly, I I just want to say that having been in the church, the local church, for more than 40 years now, I have been so blessed by the fellowship of the church. 
by the interaction, the friendship that I've had with people, but also what I've gleaned from others, learned from others. People have supported me. And on occasions, they've, they've helped me out in terms of material blessings as well. So that, is, that has been wonderful to be a part of the family of God. You know, this care for one another is, is, is so important and obviously expressive of what it means to be in fellowship. So I've been so blessed. But like any relationship that we have, not only do we receive blessing, but we give blessing. We have personal blessings, but we have personal responsibilities in the context of our relationships and particularly in the context of the church. So, you know, all that I've received through being a part of Christ's church over these many decades now, it's only right that I give back. It's only right that I invest my life and what God has graced me with into the life of the local church and into the lives of others. And it's a great privilege to do that. So here's some keys to living the koinonia lifestyle. As I say, it's not something that's just hanging out with friends. It's something much deeper than that. Firstly, I want to talk about quality of time with somebody, quality of time with people. You know, I think it's great to come to worship on Sundays with the crowd and celebrate and you and there's a, there's a hello afterwards and everybody smiles, but Koinonia takes us way beyond just a nice hello on Sunday. It takes us into the realm of caring for one another, contributing to each other's needs and serving one another, which I'll talk about in more detail, but it never happens without quality time with each other. It takes time. Now, you can't necessarily spend a lot of time with everybody, but you can endeavour to spend as much as you can with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we do that, of course, through... Not only Sundays, but our connect groups, our small groups, our different ministries that we have in the life of the church, men, women, children, uh, family events and all the different th- activities that we have through the ch- life of the church and also through serving together. I think volunteering and serving together creates a bond that is, that is unique and very special. And when you're achieving something together, there is a, a deepening of the relationships that we have. And this is koinonia. As we serve Christ together, it's expressive of that fellowship that we have in him. He served us, so we serve him and each other. So service is so important. I remember that uh, interesting song. I don't know if it's a great song, but uh, certainly was very popular at the time by the Moving Pictures Band in 1982, What About Me? So what about me? It isn't fair. I've had enough. I want my share. Can't you see? I want to live. But you just take more than you give. So I don't know whether that sounds any good or what, but it's, an interest, it's a good song in a sense, but it's all about me. I reckon we should change the words to, it's not about me. Not about me. Jesus came and he said, if you want to live, like this guy did in this song, if you want to live, give your life away. Become a servant. You know, the world's all about getting, accumulating, and it's all about me. But Jesus flips that on its head. And he says, if you really want to enter into life, you'll learn what it is to serve. Follow my example, he said. The Bible says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So service is so important, and so is giving. Giving is so important. You know, for the person who is in fellowship, koinonia, that koinonia lifestyle, it's not an act, it's, it is a lifestyle. Giving is a lifestyle where we live to give. That's God's heart, that's the way he operates and that's the way we operate too if we're serious followers of Jesus. Giving is not an imposition. Giving is not something that involves loss but it only involves gain in so many ways as we give. Of course there are There is that element of receiving as well. We should be humble enough to receive. But life is not in the getting, it's in the giving. And I want to encourage you just to check your heart today about giving because giving is never a loss for the child of God. You can't outgive God. If you're giving, you're going to see a grace upon your life that you couldn't have had otherwise. Giving is so critical to what it means to be living as a follower of Jesus. And it's expressive of this koinonia lifestyle. It's not just hanging out with your friends. It's giving to them. It's giving to your brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's time with people. It's serving others. It's serving Christ together and serving them to the betterment of their lives and to meeting their needs. It's about giving. 
giving is so important. It's such a critical thing. It's not just a one-off act that we do once a week or occasionally. It's a lifestyle. I want to talk about another thing which I think is really critical to koinonia, this koinonia lifestyle, and that is listening, listening to people. And it sort of flows out of this idea that we're going to have a, show enough interest in others that we're going to listen to them. I think listening is such a powerful um, principle of life. If we can learn to listen properly and listen well, it deepens our relationships, deepens the quality of our fellowship and helps others to feel like we're interested in them. And we all know what it's like to not be listened to when somebody's just been talking at us. They're not really interested in us. They're just yapping on when really we should be people who are willing to listen to others and listen to not just their words, but what's going on behind the words. Endeavour to understand people and to show interest in them as human beings. I think that's so important. Get past the exterior. Get past what they look like. Get past their surface language and reactions and see a real person in there. I reckon Jesus was the greatest of listeners. He listened to people. He understood people. It's one of the keys in learning to understand those that we do life with, listening. And I reckon it's worthwhile putting that high on your agenda in life that you're going to become a good listener because, frankly, there's so many that aren't. And we know that that's true. And, frank, and I must give a little disclaimer here. I'm a recovering bad listener trying to be a good listener. But listening is so important. It says to people that I value you. I validate you. And I think you're worth listening to. You're worth showing interest in. So I want to encourage you to think about that. You know, God gave us one mouth and two ears. <laughs> one mouth and two ears. I think that's for good reason. We need to be um, listening a lot more than we are speaking. There are many Bible verses in relation to this uh, that we could look at today, but we don't have time. But the Bible's full of that. Slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. So I think there's, there's, there's great biblical warrant for that. And Jesus said, even himself, he said, him who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so I think listening is so important in the context of relationships. And I want to ask you the question, are you hearing people around you? Are you hearing their cry? Are you hearing their need? Are you hearing who they are? Or are you just interested in moi, me? It's not about you. It's about them when it comes to koinonia. I'm here to serve. Jesus took off his outer garments. He wrapped a towel around himself. He got down on his knees and he washed the disciples' feet. That was a task reserved not even for, for Jewish slaves. It was for Gentile slaves in the Jewish system. Unfortunately, that was the lowest of the low. And um, just a horrible menial task that nobody would, would stoop to do unless they were the lowest of the low. So Jesus gets down on his feet and he washes his disciples' feet. And he says, do you know what I've done? Go and do likewise. Do you know what I've done here? Go and do likewise. It's this heart to serve others, to listen to others, to give to others and to the cause of Christ that really does bring us to a place where we're stepping into that koinonia lifestyle, what it really means to be in fellowship. The last thing I want to talk about briefly is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Not a popular word, <laughs> really. We value the sacrifice that people make and sometimes we're forced into making sacrifices. But for the follower of Jesus, for the one who has stepped into koinonia living, that fellowship, that quality of fellowship, that lifestyle of koinonia, sacrifice is a way of life where we're willing to lay down our lives. And it's challenging for each one of us because we constantly have that pull, don't we, to just look after ourselves and to look after our comfort. But when we have a higher purpose to live for, when we're living for the purposes of God, when we really do have a deep interest in the welfare of others and in the cause of Christ, particularly for the lost, to see them saved, then sacrifice is something that we gladly give ourselves to. And I'm asking the question of my life, and I re regularly ask this question, what am I doing to sacrifice to enhance the mission of Jesus, the lives of others, helping the poor, and so forth. The Bible says the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for others. 
to give his life. I just want to encourage you to think about that in the context of koinonia because, you know, I think so often we have consumer Christians today and I've fallen into that myself. I'm just here to receive. People say, oh, it's a great service, Pastor. I just, I was so blessed. I really get, no, I shouldn't say really, but it, it's, it's you know, I just think that sometimes we've got to step out of that. We're here for God first, for others second, and then us last. And if we get that priority, you know, I, I think we probably forget about a lot of our own needs. and We start to focus on the lo- needs of others. And so sacrifice is so important in this koino- koinonia lifestyle. Fellowship, to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. How am I doing that practically? Or am I just floating in and floating out on a Sunday, getting my spiritual top up and going back to my own life? Of course, it goes beyond the church where we're wanting to sacrifice and give and serve in the context of our families and our workplace out there in the community. But today we've been talking about Christian fellowship, what that really means. And I've got to tell you, there's a crying need for Christians to step up and be devoted to fellowship, devoted to koinonia, not just hanging out, but this deeper level of contribution, participation, sharing in, laying your life down for one another, entering into that spiritual union that we have together in Christ and celebrating the commonality that we all have and focusing on him. So, Father, we just thank you today for the fellowship of the saints. Thank you for koinonia. It's a great word and takes us beyond just the superficial into something that is more meaningful and authentic. And I pray that you'd help us to be authentic in our Christian living, that we would not be superficial, not be just water skiing, through our relationships and through church life, but rather willing to do life with each other, to get our hands dirty and to enter into true koinonia, that fellowship, that commonality, that oneness together, to celebrate the fact that we're brothers and sisters in Christ and to give our all for the well-being of the body of Christ. Father, we pray for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you're watching this now and you haven't given your life to Jesus, I want to challenge you today to think about the sacrifice that he made for you. He hung on that cross and bore all of that pain, all of that shame, all of your sin, my sin, the sin of the whole world upon himself. He, was, he made the sacrifice so that you and I could be forgiven of all of our sins. He took our penalty upon himself. He died as representative man. He took my place and he died. And then he rose again, praise God, to newness of life so that you and I could be forgiven all of our sins and have new life in him. If you haven't given your life to Jesus today, I'm going to pray a prayer and I I want you to join me in this prayer and repeat it after me. And I believe as you do that, God is going to touch your heart because the Bible says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made. Thank you that through faith in him, my sins are forgiven. I'm reconciled to God. I trust in the finished work of the cross. I surrender my heart to you. I declare you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I receive forgiveness for all of my sins. And I thank you that as I call on your name, Jesus, your word says, I shall be saved. Father, I just pray for all those that have prayed that prayer right now, even for those that have prayed for the first time. You just help them to enter into that walk of following you, Jesus, that they would abandon the idolatries of this world and make you the Lord and King of their lives. Father, we thank you that Jesus died on the cross to set us free from our sins and to reconcile us to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we know that your word says, and Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So, Father, I just thank you for your blessing on everyone today, that you'd bless their week ahead, comfort them, strengthen them, help them to follow you wholeheartedly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week. And uh, if you're in our area next Sunday, come to our church, but let us know. Send us an email, info at newlifeonline.org.au. Otherwise, you can connect again online at 10 a.m. So God bless you. Have a great week.
you danced over me while I am unaware you sing all around but I never hear a sound Lord I'm amazed by you Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me. You paint the morning sky with miracles in my my hope will always stand now you hold me in your hand lord i'm amazed by you lord i'm amazed by you lord i'm amazed by you Thank you. 